Thank you for joining me today. I'm Madeline Blair, and this is Unlocked, a show all about opening the resilient leader in you. You know, the word conversation, <clears throat> it actually means to turn around with, as if you're walking around a topic and sharing with one another what you see and think. Think of walking down the street with a friend and you see a statue maybe. And so it's so intriguing that the two of you walk around the sculpture sharing the different things you see as you move along. And as you're sharing, you're sharing through words. Uh, well, okay, and perhaps some hand gestures. But why do I talk about through words? Because the word dialogue means exactly that, through words. Our sharing, our conversation, is through words. We dialogue every day as we explore and share our world in conversation. My guest will help us understand how to get so much more from the dialogue of a conversation. And don't forget to stick around for Grounds for Thought, five minutes of what's brewing. So stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Madeline Blair, and this is Unlocked, where we build the resilient leader in you. Theodore Zeldin, author of a tiny little book called Conversation, says that conversation is when you enter into it with the willingness to change your mind. That's a powerful statement about intentions and the willingness to actually follow through. We so often want to have a conversation because it is an opportunity to put our ideas across to others. Yet according to Zeldin, this is not a conversation at all. Conversation is about listening as much as talking. Yet there are many topics that people shy away from. Just stating your opinion or reciting facts is seen as confrontational. How do we move beyond that in a manner that helps the other person know that we have heard them, even if we still disagree with them. In businesses today, staff often won't say what's on their mind or don't ask questions about something they don't understand. How do we express ourselves when, even when we feel we aren't being heard or fear reprisal? Today, I have an exceptional guest who has looked at the issue of dialogue and conversation through research study, and by exploring the topic with others as they struggle with such issues. Let me bring her on screen and introduce her. Dr. Nancy Dixon. Ah, welcome to Unlocked, Nancy. Thank you. Well, let me tell the audience a little bit about you first. Uh, you know, one conversation has the power of altering our entire life. If there is one person who knows about conversation and dialogue, it's you, Nancy. <laughs> you have been researching the effect of dialogue for much of your career and helping in places like NASA. You're a professor at and teaching at Columbia University, George Washington University, uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic, and the University of Texas, Austin. You've written eight books and over 50 articles, including Common knowledge. How, oops, let me get that on screen. Yes. <laughs> How companies thrive by sharing what they know. So, to my dear friend of many years, welcome to Unlocked, Nancy. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here, Madeline. As you say, we have known each other for such a long time. And <laughs> always, it seems to me, in this context of how we talk to each other. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, we really have to tell people one of the ways in which we met was whitewater rafting together. <laughs> I still remember yeah. that time. <laughs> we were a bit younger then. <laughs> yes, both. Both of us were, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, people think about dialogue, but I'm never sure they really know how it differs from just talking. Uh, let's begin with what dialogue means and how you have interpreted it in your work? 
good. Um, I think you're right. It's a it's a word that's sort of a common word, and I, and I think people usually mean a more serious kind of a conversation when they when they use the term dialogue, and and maybe a friendlier one is sort of the general sense I think of it. Um, I really think of it in two two ways, and one is um, dialogue as a discussion, a group, a meeting. We have a dialogue in a group meeting. Uh, and that's the way I think it's more commonly thought of. I also think of it as dialogue as a way of being. And that would mean we're using dialogue in our everyday interaction with everyone. And that's really quite a big ask, I think, is to be dialogic uh, in all of your interactions. But it, we ought to start anyway with the more common definition and more common use of it, which is dialogue as, um, as, a, as a discussion, as a group meeting. And to me, it's very similar to conversation. As I said at the beginning, you know, conversation is, is turning around together and I'm looking at a group and I can see them turning around together. And, and that dialogue simply means with words. Um, is there any other distinction or value in using both of those words or one of those words? Um, I think there are quite a few things. If we look at dialogue as, as you know, some of the researchers do, and some of the, the great thinkers do, I think there are, there's quite a difference from conversation. Um, let me tell you how I sort of, um, uh, one of the things that's important to me is to differentiate holding a dialogue to understand from coming together to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And and my first exposure to that idea was many, many years ago when I was working with the Singapore Army in Singapore. And um and I was talking with a general there, and I was talking about dialogue, and he said, he said well, let me tell you how, how we use it. He said, when we have a problem, we all the generals come together, and we have a dialogue. And, and we're not trying to decide anything at all. We're only trying to understand. Everybody gives their ideas. They question each other about their ideas. But it's not an attempt to decide anything, just to understand the situation. And then he said, maybe a day later or two days later, we go to another room, <laughs> which is really interesting. Yeah. Go to another room. And in that room, we make the decision. And that's not a dialogue. That's people pushing hard for their opinion, saying what they think should be is right, saying why they think the other person's wrong. None of that happens in dialogue. But if you're going to make a decision, all of that has to happen. So that that's a... Um, you know, I, I learned a lot from that general about this difference between decision making and and dialogue, and the real need to separate the two. And I really like the fact that he went to the other room, because it, Madeline, as you will know, if you have a, a meeting or discussion, particularly if you have an argument with someone in one space, every time you go into that space, it reminds you of that argument, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. So separating the space seems to me really quite useful, that idea. Yeah. Oh, I think there's a brilliant way to deal with a, a really challenging issue, which is how do you get people to understand each other first? And then, and then understand, once you have the understanding there, then go fight. Ah, it's for, for position and, and to make a decision. Beautiful. Well, I'm also curious. You've worked in dialogue for many years. What drew you to it in the first place? Well, that's, I haven't given much thought about that. I, you know, I think I have always been interested in how we talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, even my work in knowledge management was how do we create situations where we can, through talk, share knowledge with each other. I was never very much interested in the technology side of knowledge <laughs> management, but how do we talk to each other? And um, very early on uh, in my career, when I was teaching at the University of Texas, we had a small group of people, faculty, I think there were only five of us, and, and we invited Chris Argerus to come and uh, teach us his method of action science. And of course, that is all about how do we talk to each other. And he was just, he is so powerful and his ideas are so powerful. 
Uh, and so for many years at the University of Texas, and then later at the George Washington University, I taught courses that were really aimed at, um, at Ardress's view on, on action, action science or action learning. So I think that was my first sort of formal, but I might say one more thing about um, uh, my, my youngest son, um, when, uh, when he was about two, two and a half, we discovered that he, he, he was not talking in the way that my older son had talked, you know, I, I kind of understood how, how how children talk. And so I took him to an audiologist and said, you know, what, what's, what's going on here? Because he's not, you know, he's not talking. Uh, he's saying some words, but he's not talking like a, like a two or three year old should. And um, they didn't have much sense for me about it. Uh, they said, well, maybe you and your brother are giving him everything he needs so he doesn't have to say anything, which turned out not to be right at all. <laughs> but as he grew older, what I came to understand was he, he has learning disabilities. And so one of those disabilities prevents him, prevents him from saying words correctly. And, and, and of course, it later prevented him from being able to read and do math, et cetera, et cetera. But, but my, my attempt to help him make himself clear so that I could understand him was really, um, really a, an important part of my life. And, um, I can remember he um, he would try to talk to the other children and they couldn't understand what he was saying in the playground. Mm -hmm. And one day I remember he came in and he was trying to tell me something and I couldn't get it. I just could not get it. And he just was, you know, like this, just so <laughs> so angry and so upset. And I and it just I think it just all of that experience helped me understand how important it is to be understood by others mm -hmm. because because it was just an enormous challenge for him to be understood by others. Thankfully, as a grown man, he has managed to, you know, to right all of those things that were wrong. But it was a very hard growing up. Wow. You know, as you were describing the situation, I was thinking, we speak of children who are dyslexic because they shift letters around. Well, you can see the shift that's happening with them because they write the wrong letter <clears throat> or see the wrong letters. Whereas with sound, how do you know that it's they're hearing it differently and, and then trying to get it out? This is a real under, new understanding for me. Thank you. Yeah. And, and it, you know, in part was that they, uh, children that are learning to say would have a terrible time with nouns. And so they would try to, uh, he'd t try to tell me something, but he couldn't tell me the name of it. He, you know, so that became, and I remember one conversation, he, he went to a school for learning disabled. I remember one time bringing home, him home with a friend, they were talking in the back seat, and, and they never used a noun. You, you remember that guy that did that? They couldn't remember the name of the guy either, you know, remember that guy? Did, oh yeah, he, he was this kind, you know, this, it was back and forth, but no nouns at all, you know, because they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't pull them. They knew who they were talking about, but they couldn't hold the nouns. Anyway, that I think that greatly influenced me to understand how important our talking is and how how uh, important our listening is. Yeah, which which leads me to my next question, which has to do with what happens in a company. Why is it that there are there are times when even a topic won't be discussed or brought up, and yet it's probably essential for the survival of the company. What's your experience in this area? Um, I again think people in organizations don't know how to bring it up in a way that's not harmful for them. And let me share an experience I had with an organization that was actually the Virginia Department of Corrections. So it was an organization in which had 40 um, prison systems within the system. And the leader of that, uh, that system the, uh, had become very interested in dialogue. In fact, he had been to a meeting by, from, by Bill Isaacs and learned about dialogue. And he said, this, is, this could be helpful to us. So when he was promoted to commissioner at the University of, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the Department of Corrections of Virginia, he said, I'm gonna teach everybody in my organization dialogue which is a huge 
huge jump. And and he did that. And and over a period of 10 years, I think that that happened. But what one one of the things that was quite interesting to me was just about as I talked about the Singapore group dividing decision making and dialogue. Uh, he had a he had a four step process, not a two step process. So the first thing was, he said, "Okay, first we're going to bring together everybody that's um, that's involved in this process." So I remember one of the discussions they had was that there was too much contraband coming in to the prison system, that drugs and so forth that were coming in, and so he. Uh, so he said, okay, we need to have a meeting about this. We need to find a way to solve this. So the first thing he did was have representatives from every part of the organization that even touched this whole issue of contraband, the, the people in the mailing room, because surprisingly, some of it comes in through the mail, uh, people that were uh, in, that were in the visitor center, and all the people, people with the, uh, with the dogs that sniffed out drugs, all of the people he... He said, let's have representatives of everyone and let us think about this problem. So let's understand the problem. Let's have a dialogue on the problem. And that dialogue, not a decision making, but let's have a dialogue. So that was step one. And when the end of the dialogue, and that my dialogue might have gone on for four or five hours, at the end of that dialogue, the question was, all right, do we think we now understand this problem? understand all the aspects of the problem. And if we do, then we'll move on. So the next step was to create the desired outcome. So now that we understand what it is, what do we want, what do we want the, if we fix it, what do we want it to look like? This is still not making the decision about what to do. This is just saying, what do we want it to look like when it's fixed? That was step two. And at the end of each step, he would say, okay, are we clear about this? Have we, do we have everybody in the room that we need to solve it? And got agreement that it was okay. And then finally, they came to the decision point, which was to say, okay, now we understand it. We understand what we want. What are the actions now we need to take? So this was an actual decision as opposed to dialogue. And then after those decisions had been put into place, they would come back together and say, all right, review the outcome, did we get what we wanted? So dividing that into four steps seems to me incredibly useful in organizations. And it prevents these people that you're talking about that not wanting to be honest about it because they're not trying in that first step to say what we ought to do. They're just trying to say what's happening. And they're not afraid to say that. That's, <clears throat> that's a remarkable stepwise way to go into it. And I loved step two, that instead of immediately trying to solve it, you say, what is it going to look like if we really solve the solve it yes. without yeah. putting any constraints on that? Ah, that's just so beautiful. Yeah. Hmm. And it, as I recall, I remember from one of your lectures that I was sitting in on, you talked about an example in the, in the, um, the prison system where people who had learned this were actually able to apply it in a setting where one of the inmates had become angry. I, I'm sorry if I'm right. catching you off guard, but I'm sure you remember that example. Yes, yeah, that sticks very strongly in my memory. Yeah, that was, um, the, the group uh, was, uh, a, a prisoners were all in a class because they were very close to being released. And so this class was about, um, how do we write a resume? How do we have an interview? So how do we get a job? That's what it was about. And uh, the, the woman, Jenny, the woman that was teaching it, a wonderful, wonderful person who, who had dialogue in her whole being. She was amazing. Uh, so she was in the middle of the class. One of the participants came in late and he was very angry. And he, he, he came in and the first thing he did was go up to the wall and hit the wall with his fist and knocked a hole in it. And, and she was, you know, like, whoo, <laughs> she, she said, um, I think his name was Lionel. She said, Lionel, uh, I think we need to have a dialogue. And so she brought all the people that were working on their resumes and things all together in a circle. And, and she asked Lionel, okay, what's going on? And what he said was, uh, he said, I'm going to be released in two weeks. 
and my family has said, I cannot come back. And he was so angry and hurt. He was hurt as much as he was angry, hurt about that. And so he told he told that, and then other other people in the circle began to tell about their families and you know when they had not been when they had been dismissed. And so it became a it became a dialogue about how do we deal with these these very difficult situations. Um, and I will I, sh I should say that that Lionel. Um, had to uh, he didn't he didn't talking about it wasn't enough yet he also had to repair the wall <laughs> had to come back and repair the wall but he wasn't but what Jenny told me when she told me that story she said it before we were doing dialogue if he had done that they would have come and got him and they would have put him in the hole which means you know, solitaire but they didn't because because they understood that what was going on with with Lionel. And, and I don't know that it was reasonable that he punched the wall, but my heart goes out to someone who says you can't come home, can't come back. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you remembered that story because <clears throat> I remember the impact it had on me at the time and it's having the yeah. same impact today. The, yeah. the, the fact that she, as you said, she, she was dialogue in her yeah. being in her very being so that she did not immediately take offense. She didn't take it personally. She did nothing like that. She just said, okay. Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah. And her first reaction was, okay, something's happened to him. Something's, yeah. something's wrong here. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and her first reaction was, okay, let's talk about it. Let's, let's come to the circle. Of course. Yeah. Of course he had been exposed to dialogue, you know, through, through yeah. her, her work ahead of that. But yeah, I, it's a powerful story and it's a powerful example, I think, of what dialogue can do. Yeah. Well, let's take another example. And that is a situation where perhaps you're meeting with, uh, let's say, strangers. You don't know if they understand what dialogue means. Uh, and a topic comes up that's uh, an emotional one. Um, how do we redirect a conversation when there is tension in the room? Um, I think the, the first thing is that rather, if, let's say someone says something that we think is ridiculous or wrong or bad. I think the first thing and maybe the most important thing about dialogue is that we ask a question. Mm. Not that we reply and say, that's wrong. You shouldn't think that. That's not the right way. Uh, our first Our first step needs to be to try to understand, to ask a question, you know, and, and, and we'd have to have a real situation to say this, but it's like, you know, what led you to that view? You know, what experiences have you had that, that have caused that feeling in you or that, le that led you to believe that? So in a way, we're not legitimizing their belief, but we're trying to understand what's behind their statements. And I think the problem is, particularly if, if when we get into some of these political statements, is that we just immediately categorize the other person rather than trying to understand the other person. And, and let me give you an example. Uh, I think this is such a good example. Um, and this is quite old. In the 1980s, a group with, which was called, I think, the Conversations Project. I think they've changed their name now. But they're now called Essential Partners. But at that point, they were trying to bring together women who were for and women who were against abortion. And so the way they did that was that they would put two women together for a day and they would ask the women to tell their life story. Mm. And at the end of that day, each of the women didn't change their view of, about abortion, but they, they had, sort of like with Lionel, they had an understanding of what would have led to that view. Mm. So I think very often the worst thing we do is immediately to counter as opposed to trying to understand. So these women came out of those that day-long experience as friends, as seeing themselves as more than their opinion about that one issue. And that's what we want. Um, we want to see people larger than, the, than their opinion about one thing. Mm. Or two things. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, I'm I'm curious. Do, do you think we could model this for our audience? Not for a long time, but just maybe a few minutes. Uh, I mean, I'm willing to be a guinea pig and have you. All right, but you have to say something real. Okay, <laughs> all, right. all right. <laughs> I'm going to say the following, and let me tell you, I really believe this: that all every right. every person should be learning something new every day. That's a, an interesting idea, Madeline. And and what what has led you to to that idea? How did you get there? Why is well, that so important? Well, I, you know, I find my own life that that if I'm not exploring something new each day, um, I get bored. Uh, but it's more than that. I guess it's 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 having grown up with a mother who was always learning. You know, and I mean, she, she was amazing. She, she, I don't know how she did it. She ran a farm, she ran a small business and she took care of four kids and a house. And every day she would spend an hour reading the local newspaper because that's, that was one of the things that at that time was a really important document to be, to be. So that was, I guess that's where I got it from. Yeah. That's a powerful, uh, that's a powerful lesson. Those that, Lessons that we grow up with, isn't it? How how well how yes. well they influence us. Is your feeling that that it should be applied to all people? You're talking about your, you learned it in your family. Does it seem to you that it's applicable to all people, or is there a, a sort of a group of people that that need that? Well, of course, in my mind, it should be every person, and I know right. that that's not possible um, because some of us are ill and. Um, our lack energy. Some of us lack opportunity to, for example, get something to read. Or, um, but gosh, my, I, I can tell you that my desire in my heart is that every single person would be curious about the world and willing to, to learn something new. Yeah, that is that is such a it's such a beautiful idea, and if I like your example, if. If they didn't have an access to books, you know, let's say they were in a country, mm. uh, you know, where they didn't have access, is it still possible for them to learn something new without the books? And oh, that's a school? great question. That's a great question, and I have talked about this many times. Yes, it is, because, for example, if I go to a class, for example, in the class where I'm, I'm camp, they're ostensibly to learn, and the and the instructor is telling is saying nothing that I don't already know and maybe even saying it poorly and I've I have disciplined myself I say okay what is it that I can learn about this person mm. about the interaction between the person and the audience what's happening in the audience so I tend to widen my view so to speak and see what else I can learn yes that's a lovely that's a lovely example yeah mm. Is that is that enough, Madeline? I think so. I was feeling the same way. Yeah, I think it's enough. But I really, I really appreciate that you probed me this way, because you know I said things that I've never said before, even yeah. to myself. So very helpful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. We should probably say something about that. if we're calling for dialogue in an organization. So how does that happen, and what do we do? Because that's mm. I think an important yes. issue. And and I would I would say there are, there I could tick off a bunch of things, but one is that that it should be an invitation, and I'm sort of um, I'm relying on Peter Block's ideas here, but it should not be a demand. So if if there's a topic we need to talk about, I'm thinking about a topic in an organization. You, you know, um, organizations made this decision. Um, do we think it's a good decision? We, it, it ought to be by invitation because we're going to ask people to be honest and open. So don't, you know, only come by invitation. And that you need to understand ahead of time what you're coming to. That is, you're coming to a dialogue as opposed to a normal sort of a conversation. I think, I think there needs not to be a leader in a dialogue. Mm. I think there needs to be a, somebody that convenes it but then steps back and just becomes a 
participant so that there's no one that you're trying to please, uh, no one that, that uh, says that's right or wrong or says now we need to do this or that. Um, I think we need to acknowledge in a dialogue that we're not trying to come to a decision, that we're trying to understand. So I think we need to leave a lot of space in a dialogue to give people time to think. Because if, if, if we don't, then people just come to the next topic without uh, taking time. I've written a, a blog um, uh, in, my, in my blog uh, that's called Hold an Idea Lightly. <laughs> and it seems to me if we're going to a meeting about something we care about, we need to do our homework. We need to, you know, really think through what we think is right. We need to gather any data we have, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're in a dialogue, once you get to that meeting, then you need to hold that idea lightly, which means you are willing to have it changed. Yeah. You're willing to change, yeah. right? And, and that's really not easy to do, to hold an idea lightly. <laughs> like your idea about lifelong learning, you know, learning, you hold that idea very deeply. It's hard to hold it lightly. That's right. You know, but you were willing, when I said, well, what if people don't have exposure to books? Blah, 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 you were willing to not back away from the idea, but you were willing to um, alter that idea a bit, right? Mm -hmm. So what we need to do in dialogue is to hold our, dear, our idea lightly enough that it can get changed. Mm -hmm. Because every idea we have is not truth. Every idea we have is something that we learned, right? Yeah. You know, we learned it from reading, we learned it from experience, we learned it from whatever, we learned it. And we're constantly learning. So if we come into a dialogue with the idea that, okay, I want to get this idea across, but I can I can hold it very lightly in, in the discussion. I think that's a really interesting distinction when you said Every idea we have is something we have learned. Yes. That, that, that says to me that, it, well, let me give you an example. My husband and I built our house. I mean, we didn't build it. We had a contract to build it. But once I watched a house being built, I realized I can do anything that I want because I can unbuild and build. So in other words, you learned all the things that constructs it. And, and it, suddenly I'm looking, thinking about what I know and my ideas. And now I know that they can be reconstructed as well. Yeah, I think that's right. And th there's a wonderful quote. I, I, I brought it with me because I'm so fond of it. If, look, may, may I just read it to Absolutely. you in the audience? This is a quote by Mary Parker Follett, who, who is not well known, but she was, uh, she was actually a consultant to um, uh, Roosevelt, which is amazing, to Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, that someone that long ago could be a consultant. But anyway, here's what she says. She says, I do not go to a meeting merely to give my own ideas. If that were all, I might write my fellow members a letter. But neither do I go simply to learn other people's ideas. If that were all, I might ask each to write me a letter. I go to a meeting in order that all together we may create a group idea. An idea which will be better than all of our ideas added together. For this group idea will not be produced by the process of addition, but by the interpenetration of us all. Isn't that lovely? Uh, the yes. Interpenetration. So she's saying it's not just now I know what you know. It, it's like your idea reshaped my idea. That's interpenetration. When, when, when one idea impacts another idea. It, you know, we often talk about uh, emergence and, and it's hard to think about emergence, but this is a perfect example of yes. the mixing of ideas and allowing them to interpen interpenetrate really does yes. allow something new to emerge. Yeah. Mm. Well, okay. Yeah, you know, I forget what, what, what the, your, your original question was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm not sure. I, I remember it myself. <laughs> All right. Well, we have not talked about dialogue as a way of being. And, 
I, I don't know how much time we have left, but I'd, I'd love to get that. I think that if you do it, then do it. What all is right. this thing about dialogue as a so way that of means being? In all of our interactions with our neighbor, with the grocery store clerk, you know, with everyone we interact with, that we that we interact with them from the sense of them being a, a person. I think in organizations, we get to feeling like people are tools. <laughs> you know, in fact, uh, the, the, Boober, I don't know if I can find his quote. Um, let me look quickly and see if I can find, find his quote. Because Boober says that we need to see others as a thou, not an it. Yeah that an it is instrumental. It is, it is, I'm using you for something I need, or you're using me for something you need, right? And I'm don't, I don't value as an individual, I value as a tool, as a way to get something done. I'm suggesting we need to stop that in organizations and everywhere else, that we need to interact each other as human being first. And, and I'm reminded that um, the last book that Edgar Schein wrote was Humble Inquiry. Yeah. Have you have you seen that that book? I, I um, have not seen it. No, uh, Shine actually to. died about four or five months ago, and uh, uh, it, and it's, and anyway, it, it, um, he he was so impactful to me in my thinking. I just I I miss him. Just I miss miss his intellect. But he has he talks about humble inquiry in an organization, and he says he says the problem we have with organizations is that we is that we talk in, instrumentally. We talk we yeah. talk to others as though they're tools. Yeah. We talk to others as though we, their, their value is getting something done. And he says we need to change that and talk to people as though they are friends, mm -hmm. that they are comrades, right? Yeah. Because they are, uh, because it, it harms people to be viewed only as a tool. So, so that idea, could we, at all times, think of the person um, uh, in this larger sense. You know, I, I'm thinking of even when we're meeting with someone around something that's, pol that's polarized, like, okay, this person is a Biden supporter, but he's also does meals on wheels. So this person is a Trump supporter, but he's also uh, a caregiver of elderly parents. You know, that, that everybody is more than just one thing. So that idea, if we could if we could get rid of thinking of people as, as just, they're just the clerk in the store, they're just, you know, they're just my angry neighbor. Who, who the, if we could, the, people are always more than than just one thing. So so if we can keep that in our minds, then then interacting with them in a dialogical way, then we're able to see the other parts of them, to know the other parts of them. Mm. Can, can you think of, of ways in which you've been able to do that in, you know, in interacting with other, with other people? Um, well, I, I have to tell you a little secret, which I only re realized myself a few weeks ago when I was in conversation with someone and I said to them, you don't understand. I was raised that each person, simply because they existed, were worthy. Yes. And that's how I was raised, Nancy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, wow, what a gift I had. Yes. Oh, that is wonderful. Yes. Yes. Now, it doesn't mean I don't disagree with people and get angry at them. That's not the point. But the point is, at the essence, I know that they are worthy to be. And even though I may not just dislike them, I may hate what they do, but they're still worthy. Wow. I still yeah. have difficulty even understanding that that's what's going on inside me. <laughs> yeah. So that, that idea of um, trying to be dialogic in in all of our interactions, not just not just when we come to the group, <laughs> but in all of our interactions mm -hmm. with with others, I think it actually requires a change of heart. Mm -hmm. You know, not just it, it's not a skill; it's it's really a, a willingness inside to see the other as as 
more than whatever their role is to mm -hmm. see them as human. Yeah. The, there, there is one, there is one exception to even what I, I'm talking about. And that, and, and it's because so much emotion gets arisen when I meet a bully. And I'm curious if you talk about that in terms of how you have worked with organizations where they had to deal with that kind of individual in a dialogic situation. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, let me tell, tell a story about Braver Angels and, and see if we can come okay. back to that uh -huh. question. Um, for, for about three or four years, I, facilitated groups for this group called Braver Angels. And it's a group that tries to bring the right and the left in the United States together, the reds and the blues, we call them together. And, and the way we do that is to hold uh, all day long meetings, actually six hour, six hour meetings, and we have an equal number of reds and blues come. And there are two facilitators, one that's more red and one that's more blue. And, and then, we ask each group, like one of the exercises we do is a fishbowl and we put one of the sides in, let's say we put the reds inside and then, and the blues are on the outside, the blues are just listening, the reds are talking. And we ask the question of, of what do you see, what are you proud of that your side has done? And they talk about that. And then we say, and, and what worries you about what your side have done? And they, then they talk about that. And then we switch sides, blues comes in, same thing. So we have a lot of exercises like that we're doing during it. But here's the amazing thing. When, when we leave the last, at the end of the meeting, people who are totally opposite are patting each other on the back, are smiling at each other, are saying we need mm. to get together for coffee, you know, because they have learned something about that. They've learned, first of all, that other people are more like them than they are different, <laughs> which is amazing, you, you know, because we, we, we tend to think, you know, the other side is totally different than we are. And, and they are, uh, so that recognition, that person is more like me than different, that, you know, that person's different. Nobody changes their mind in these meetings. They all, they hold their same, you know, they tightly hold their same opinions, but they come away caring about each other as people. Mm. Now, let me see why, I, what was the question that- About bullies, that? about bullies. bullies. Because, yeah. because bullies, you know, my, my reaction is immediate. I mean, it's an emotional reaction, so I have to deal with the emotion. Yes. But, but talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I guess we, we'd almost have to create this issue, but I guess I would go back to what we were talking about earlier, which was to, which was to say to the other, I can see that you are really upset about this, or, you, you know, I, I can hear it in your language that you're upset about. Tell me about what's going on that, that got you so upset. Okay. You know, so we're back to that, trying to understand, trying to understand the person behind the comment, the person behind the action. Now, in the moment of someone knocking someone other over, that, that's probably not, not possible, but it might be possible afterwards. You know, it might be possible when you sat down with them or when the counselor and you sat down with them and then that, and then those questions are asked, you know, what, what, what was so, what was going on inside of you? What was so powerful? Um, mm -hmm. And, and people do always have answers, you know, like the answer you gave when I asked, you know, around the question of lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. There are always things behind that that we don't, we don't, we're not aware of. We only see the surface. Mm -hmm. But the only way I think to get beyond the surface is, is dialogue, which, which means to to in 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 every in every instance we have so to try and I think that's a very hard ask incidentally to be dialogic in all our interactions no question no question uh, yeah <laughs> first, first of all emotion is involved but I think another is that I'm not sure that we all are ready to be curious all the time I mean that takes a certain amount of energy to be curious about yeah. a situation and then even if you're curious, do you have the facility to ask a question that will not 
<laughs> create even more emotion in the room. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Like, why did you say that? It's not. Uh, it's not a good question. <laughs> why is generally not a good question. <laughs> yeah, why questions are yes, they're they're out. That's right. Yeah. Oh gosh, oh, well, Nancy, I <laughs> I can't believe where we are on the time, but I knew this would be a, a lively conversation. But there is one question uh, I want to ask, and you know, often when I prepare these for these. I ask uh, teenagers to give me questions because I always think that they see the world differently. Uh, what's one, and this is one a question from a teenager, what's one tip you can immediately implement into everyday dialogue to make it more effective? I guess I'd have to say that to speak from the heart. <sighs> And I, again, know that's an incredibly difficult ask to speak from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, because when we get angry, when we feel hurt, we, we block all that, don't we? Yeah. We block our thinking. We block our, we block our heart. We, 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 mm -hmm. we want to retaliate. Um, you know, I just I have to go back and think of Jenny and and her. She spoke when she saw what Lionel did. She spoke from her heart. She knew that Lionel, you know, she knew that something bad had happened to Lionel. And um, so I think that's I think that's what we need to do. But but again, I think that takes a, a change in us. Mm. I think we have to spend some time. Maybe it's time in medication, in meditation. You know, maybe it's maybe it's time in, in something else. But I think we need to to get to that place. Mm -hmm. Beautiful advice. Okay, how can people get in touch with you? And do you have any other final words for our audience? <laughs> Well, uh, I'm at Nancy Dixon at commonknowledge.org, and I do write a blog, which uh, which I I talk about all of these kinds of issues, and it's nancydixonblog.com, so it's pretty easy to remember, nancydixonblog.com. Um, and uh, and like I said, I, I've written, a, uh, one of the last things I wrote about was this idea of holding an idea lightly. Mm -hmm. So go there and kind of, kind of read that. Great. Well, Nancy Dixon, thank you so much for this wonderful interaction. Well, and I... thank you, Madeline, for all your good questions and for doing this program. Uh, how wonderful for people to have this to access and to listen to. So I'm I'm so glad that you're you're doing this unlocked. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Nancy. Every now and then, there is something that changes how I think about the world. Grounds for Thought is a place where I talk about these moments so that you can explore the meaning for yourself. In my work on resilience, I found that those who are highly resilient are able to sit in ambiguity with things that are confusing and even contradictory. I believe this comes from a strong sense of who they are so that this kind of puzzle doesn't really threaten them. Some people feel that if you're holding or trying to hold two opposing thoughts in your mind, the better thing is to discover the truth of the matter. However, there are things in nature that are both ambiguous and, ambiguous and paradoxical and where both perspectives are true. For example, light is a wave, but it's also a particle all at the same time. I can remember the first time I encount encountered that paradox thinking, how could that possibly be? And over the years, I learned that holding those two opposing ideas allowed me to see the universe as a much more complex entity than my simple mind understood. What I discovered was that the more comfortable I became with accepting the fact that light was both of these things simultaneously, the more comfortable I became with entertaining different opinions I may have actually disagreed with both sides of the perspective, but I knew 
that I had the capacity to sit them in my mind until I discovered something new that rationalized them, brought them together, or revealed a gap, perhaps, that no one was even seeing. This became particularly valuable when I worked with organizations where we were looking at knowledge that was needed to perform the functions of an organization. People didn't describe things the same way. Sitting with an, the ambiguity allowed questions to arise that helped to further understand what was actually at issue. When I discovered William Isaac's book, let me show you that book with all its little post-its. See, you've got lots of post-its. It's called Dialogue and the Art of Thinking Together. And now that we've listened to Nancy, we know what that means. Well, anyway, in that book, I was pleased to see that the same function of sitting in ambiguity became one of his principles. He calls it the principle of awareness. He says, quote, the impairment of our senses is a function of our brain's continuous attempt to give us a coherent and stable view of things. We fill in missing details in order to have this coherence, but then we miss the gaps. Uh, that got me thinking. Suddenly, I saw the inefficiency of reading between the lines, filling in the gaps, assuming what I didn't hear. Suddenly, I realized that asking questions was a much better way to fill in the gaps because there was a gap in my thinking or in how the other person put their thoughts into words. Often, in responding to my question, the person actually acknowledged they understood their statement more clearly themselves. I've always been curious, and I'm also someone who thinks I see the missing pieces. And I decided that my better quality was my curiosity. Isaacs convinced me right then and there. Ask questions, Madeline, when you don't see things as clean and clear. This book is written for leaders, leaders who want to get the best from staff. Here's another example from Isaacs. Quote, conversations where people are generally being true to themselves, speaking their own voice and listening to a way, listening in a way that sustains listening from others feels good, if not always comfortable. One gets the sense that something important is happening, unquote. I loved that phrase, something important is happening so important that we didn't we don't fill in the gaps ourselves rather we listen ask questions and listen to answers as a leader of probably more than 600 teams i have learned that this is a remarkably i'm going to say easy pattern for a team to learn for themselves once they see it modeled with the results and <clears throat> a little encouragement from the leader when they fell back into telling mode instead of listening mode. Okay, what sparks your thinking? Dialogue and the Art of Thinking Together by William Isaacs. I wanna thank you for joining me today. I hope you have enjoyed the conversation and learned something new. And if you would like to explore what it means to discover, build or rev up, the resilient leader in you. With me as your coach, go to my website, madelineblair.com and schedule a conversation. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the like button. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe so you don't miss any of my shows. I'm Madeline Blair, wishing you infinite possibilities as you unlock your resilient leader.